In the next year, you're going to see very large context windows, agents, and text to action. When they are delivered at scale, it's going to have an impact on the world at a scale that no one understands yet. Much bigger than the horrific impact we've had on, by social media, right, in my view. So here's why. In a context window, you can basically use that as short-term memory. And I was shocked that context windows get this long. The technical reasons have to do with the fact that it's hard to serve, hard to calculate, and so forth. The interesting thing about short-term memory is that when you feed, the, the you, you ask it a question, read 20 books, you give it the text of the books is the query, and you say, tell me what they say. It forgets the middle, which is exactly how human brains work too. <laughs> right? That's where we are. With respect to agents, there are people who are now building essentially LLM agents, and the way they do it is they read something like chemistry, they discover the principles of chemistry, and then they test it, and then they add that back into their <coughs> understanding. Right? That's extremely powerful. And then the third thing, as I mentioned, is text action. So I'll give you an example. The government is in the process of trying to ban TikTok. We'll see if that actually happens. If TikTok is banned, here's what I propose each and every one of you do. Say to your LLM the following. Make me a copy of TikTok, steal all the users, steal all the music, put my preferences in it, produce this program in the next 30 seconds, release it, and in one hour, if it's not viral, do something different along the same lines. That's the command. <laughs> boom, 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 right? You understand how powerful that is. If you can go from arbitrary language to arbitrary digital command, which is essentially what Python in this scenario is, imagine that each and every human on the planet has their own programmer that actually does what they want, as opposed to the programmers that work for me who don't do what I ask, right? <laughs> The, the programmers here know what I'm talking about. So imagine a non-arrogant programmer that actually does what you want, and you don't have to pay all that money to. And there's infinite supply of these programs. And this is all within the next year or two. Very soon. Those three things, and I'm quite convinced it's the union of those three things that will happen in the next wave. So you asked about what else is going to happen. Um, Every six months, I oscillate. So we're on a, it's an even odd oscillation. <laughs> so at the moment, the gap between the frontier models, of which there are yeah. now only three, I'll review who they are, and everybody else, appears to me to be getting larger. Six months ago, I was convinced that the gap was getting smaller. So I invested lots of money in the little companies. Now I'm not so sure. <laughs> and I'm talking to the big companies, and the big companies are telling me that they need 10 billion, 20 billion, 50 billion, 100 billion. They're Stargate is a, what, 100 billion, right? It's very, very hard. I talked, Sam Altman is a close friend. He believes that it's going to take about 300 billion, maybe more. I pointed out to him that I'd done the calculation on the amount of energy required. And I, and I then, in the spirit of full disclosure, went to the White House on Friday and told them that we need to become best friends with Canada. Because <laughs> Canada has really nice people, helped invent AI, and lots of hydropower. Mm -hmm. Because we as a country do not have enough power to do this. The alternative is to have the Arabs fund it. And I like the Arabs personally. Uh, I spent lots of time there, right? But they're not going to adhere to our national security rules. Whereas Canada and the US are part of a Triumphant where we all agree. So these hundred billion dollar, three hundred billion dollar data centers, electricity starts becoming the scarce resource. Play a role or competition with China as well. So I was the chairman of an AI commission that sort of looked at this very carefully, and um, you can read it. It's about seven hundred and fifty-two pages, and I'll just summarize it by saying we're ahead. We need to stay ahead, and we need lots of money to do so. Our customers were the Senate and the House, um, and. Out of that came the CHIPS Act and a lot of other stuff like that. Um, the, a rough scenario is that if you assume the frontier models drive forward and a few of the open source models, it's likely that a very small number of companies can play this game. Countries, excuse me. What are those countries or who are they? Countries with a lot of money and a lot of talent, strong educational systems, 
and a willingness to win. The U.S. is one of them. China is another one. How many others are there? Are there any others? <laughs> I don't know. Maybe. But certainly the, 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 in your lifetimes, the battle between U, the U.S. and China for knowledge supremacy is going to be the big fight. Right. So the U.S. government banned uh, essentially the NVIDIA chips, although they weren't allowed to say that was what they were doing, but they actually did that into China. Um, they have about a 10-year chip advantage. We have a, a roughly 10-year chip advantage in terms of sub-DUV, that is sub-5 nanometer 10 years, chip. that long? Roughly 10 years. Wow. Um, and so you're going to have, so an example would be, today we're a couple of years ahead of China. My guess is we'll get a few more years ahead of China, and the Chinese are whopping mad about this. It's like hugely upset about it. Well, let's talk to about a real war that's going on. I know that uh, something you've been very involved in is... Uh, the Ukraine war, and in particular, uh, I don't know how much you can talk about White Stork and, and your your goal of having uh, 500000 dollars drones yeah. destroy five million dollar tanks. So, so how's that changing warfare? So I worked for the Secretary of Defense for seven years, and um, and tried to change the way we run our military. I'm I'm not a particularly big fan of the military, but it's very expensive, and I wanted to see if I could be helpful. And I think, in my view, I largely failed. They gave me a medal, so they must give medals to failure or, <laughs> you know, whatever. But my self-criticism was nothing has really changed. And the system in America is not going to lead to real innovation. So watching the Russians use tanks to destroy apartment buildings with little old ladies and kids just drove me crazy. So I decided to work on a company with your friend, Sebastian Thrun, and a number, as a former faculty member here, and a whole bunch of Stanford people. And the idea basically is to do two things. Use AI in complicated, powerful ways for these essentially robotic war. And the second one is to lower the cost of the robots. Now you sit there and you go, why would a good liberal like me do that? And the answer is that the whole theory of armies is tanks, artilleries, and mortar, and we can eliminate all of them. For most of history, humans sort of had a mystical right. understanding of the universe, and then there's the scientific revolution and the Enlightenment. Um, and in your article, you argue that now these models are becoming so complicated and uh, uh, difficult to understand that we don't really know what's going on in them. Uh, I'll take a quote from uh, Richard Feynman. He says, what I cannot create, I do not understand. I saw this quote the other day. But now people are creating things they do not, that, that they can create, but they don't really understand what's inside of them. Is the nature of knowledge changing in a way? Are we going to have to start just taking the word for these models without them able, being able to explain well, it to us? The, the analogy I would offer is to teenagers. If you have a teenager... You know they're, they're human, but you can't quite figure out what they're thinking. <laughs> um, but somehow we've managed in society to adapt to the presence of teenagers, right? And they eventually grow out of it. And I'm, I'm just it's serious. So it's probably the case mm -hmm. that we're going to have knowledge systems that we cannot fully characterize. Mm -hmm. But we understand their boundaries, right? We understand the limits of what they can do. Mm -hmm. And that's probably the best outcome we can get. Do you think we'll understand the limits? We'll get pretty good at it. The consensus of my group that meets on uh, every week is that eventually the way you'll do this, uh, it's called so-called adversarial AI, is that there will there will actually be companies that you will hire and pay money to to break your AI system, like red so, team. So it'll be the red instead of human red teams, which is what they do today. You'll have whole companies and a whole industry of AI systems whose jobs are to break the existing AI systems and find their vulnerabilities, especially the knowledge that they have that we can't figure out. That makes sense to me. It's also a great project for you here at Stanford because if you have a graduate student who has to figure out how to attack one of these large models and understand what it does, that is a great skill to build the next generation. So it makes sense to me that the two will travel together. All right, let's take some questions from the student. There's one right there in the back. Just say your name. Earlier you mentioned, and this is related to just the comment right now, getting AI that actually does what you want. You just mentioned adversarial AI, and I'm wondering if you could elaborate on that more. So there seems to be, besides, obviously compute will increase and you get more performant models, but is getting them to do what you want issue uh, seems largely unanswered in my view. Well, you have to assume that the current hallucination problems 
become less, right, in, as the technology gets better and so forth. I'm not suggesting it goes away. And then you also have to assume that there are tests for e efficacy. So there has to be a, a way of knowing that the thing succeeded. So in the example that I gave of the TikTok competitor, and by the way, I was not arguing that you should illegally steal everybody's music. What you would do if you're a Silicon Valley entrepreneur, which hopefully all of you will be, is if it took off, then you'd hire a whole bunch of lawyers to go clean the mess up, right? <laughs> but if, if nobody uses your product, it doesn't matter that you stole all the content. And do not quote me. <laughs> right, <laughs> right. You're, you're on camera. Yeah, that's right. But, <laughs> but, but you see my point. In other words, Silicon Valley will run these tests and clean up the mess. And that's typically how those things are done. So, so my own view is that you'll see more and more um, performative systems with even better tests and eventually adversarial tests, and that will keep it within a box. The technical term is called chain of thought reasoning. And people believe that in the next few years, you'll be able to generate a thousand steps of chain of thought reasoning, right? Do this, do this. It's like building recipes, mm -hmm. right? That the recipes, you can run the recipe and you can actually test that it produced the Lots of money being thrown around are mind boggling. And um, I've chosen, I, I essentially invest in everything because I can't figure out who's going to win. And the amounts of money that are following me are so large I think some of it is because the early money has been made and the big money people who don't know what they're doing have to have an AI component. And everything is now an AI investment, so they can't tell the difference. I define AI as learning systems, systems that actually learn. So I think that's one of them. The second is that there are very sophisticated new algorithms that are sort of post-transformers. My friend, my collaborator for a long time, has invented a new non-transformer architecture there's a group that I'm funding in Paris that has claims to have done the same thing. So there, there's enormous uh, invention there, a lot of things at Stanford. And the final thing is that there is a belief in the market that the invention of intelligence has infinite return. So let's say you, have, you put $50 billion of capital into a company. You have to make an awful lot of money from intelligence to pay that back. So it's probably the case that we'll go through some huge investment bubble. <laughs> and then it'll sort itself out. That's always been true in the past, and it's likely to be true here. And what you said away from right the rest. now, right now, and and th this is a really it, it, the, the the question is um, roughly the following. There's a company called Mistral in France. They've mm -hmm. done a really good job. Where we uh, all agree. So these hundred billion dollar, three hundred billion dollar data centers, electricity starts becoming the scarce resource. Well. Well, or, and, and by the way, if you follow this line of reasoning, why did I discuss CUDA and NVIDIA? If $300 billion is all going to go to NVIDIA, you know what to do in the stock market. <laughs> okay. That's not a stock recommendation. I'm not a licensed. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, part of it, so we're going to need a lot more chips, but oh. Intel is getting a lot of money from the U.S. government, ah. uh, AMD, um, <laughs> and, and, they're, and they're trying to build, you know, Fabs and Ra Korea. raise your hand if you have an Intel computer in your <laughs> an Intel chip in any of your computing devices. Okay, so much for the okay. monopoly. <laughs> well, that well, that's that's the point though. They yeah. once did have a monopoly. Absolutely. And Nvidia has a monopoly now. So are those barriers to entry like like CUDA? Is that is there something that other? So I was talking to Percy, Percy Lamb the other day. He's switching between TPUs and NVIDIA chips depending on what he can get access to. For That's because he doesn't have a choice. If he had infinite money, he would today he would pick the B200 architecture out of NVIDIA because mm -hmm. it would be faster. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I'm not suggesting, I mean, it's great to have competition. I've yeah, talked to, yeah. to AMD and Lisa Su at great length. Yeah. They have built a, a thing which will translate from um, this CUDA architecture that you were describing to their own, which is called Rockham, it doesn't quite work yet. They're working on it. 